Good day, my friends, and welcome to another exciting episode of the Daily Torah Broadcast, a ministry of the Messianic Discipleship Institute. You can always visit us online at mymdi.org and download previous episodes of the Daily Torah Podcast. Contact us and let us know what you are learning so far. Today we are on day seven of this week's Daily Torah series called Shemini. Yesterday we discussed the instructions given by God regarding the handling of dead animals to avoid contamination and disease. Today our Torah portion concludes for this week with God commanding us to sanctify ourselves and be holy before Him. If you have your Bibles and notepads handy, get them ready or listen and review later. But let's pick up the story in Leviticus chapter 11 beginning in verse 41. In Leviticus chapter 11, verse 41, we read, And every creeping thing that creeps on the earth shall be an abomination. It shall not be eaten. Whatever crawls on its belly, whatever goes on all fours, or whatever has many feet among all creeping things that creep on the earth, these you shall not eat, for they are an abomination. You shall not make yourselves abominable with any creeping thing that creeps, nor shall you make yourselves unclean with them, lest you be defiled by them. For I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore consecrate yourselves, and you shall be holy, for I am holy. Neither shall you defile yourselves with any creeping thing that creeps on the earth, For I am the Lord who brings you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. This is the law of the animals and the birds and every living creature that moves in the waters and of every creature that creeps on the earth to distinguish between the unclean and the clean and between the animal that may be eaten and the animal that may not be eaten. So my friends, here we have God's very clear instructions on what foods to eat. It's very clear. Nothing could be more clear than what God has written here in Leviticus 11 that we have been covering all this week. God's principles of holiness take center stage here. The dietary laws serve as a practical expression of the separation distinguishing Israel and us from all other nations. Without God's Torah and instruction book for living holy, righteous lives before Him, mankind does and did whatever is as right, whatever is right in their own eyes. Even among profession Christians today, many twist the scriptures here in Leviticus 11 and Acts 10, thinking they can now negate God's clear laws of holiness and do whatever is right in their own eyes. Man always comes up with lots of good excuses to sin. And my friends, I can't emphasize this enough. Eating unclean food like pork, shellfish, and all that we have discussed here this week is sin before God. It's an abomination, and it's his words, not mine. In addition to God instructing us what is good and bad for our bodies, his intent is also to make Israel and us a holy nation set apart for him. These dietary laws are provide an opportunity for us to demonstrate obedience to God. Our choice of what to eat reflects our commitment to God's commands. I can't make this any clearer, my friends, than what God has already written here in Leviticus 11. Jesus never ate pork, and neither did Paul or any of the early Messianic believers give us permission to do so. Man has no authority. The church has no authority. The Pope has no authority to change what God has ordained. Just as the dietary laws were a test for Israel, our obedience to God's commands, including those found in the Torah, reflects our devotion to Yeshua. His sacrifice calls us 
to live holy lives before him. My friends, we must learn to choose the good, God's ways, and refuse the bad, worldly influences. Our daily decisions matter, and holiness remains a central theme in our walk with the Messiah. Now, this week's Torah portion reminds us that our choices matter, even in seemingly mundane matters like food. As Messianic believers, we strive for holiness, reflecting our commitment to the God who redeemed us. Now, let's turn to our half Torah portion in 2 Samuel chapter 7, beginning in verse 12. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, beginning in verse 12, we read, he's speaking to David, he says, When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you, who will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the blows of the sons of men. But my mercy shall not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, Saul, whom I removed from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. And in verse 17, according to all these words and according to all this vision, so Nathan spoke to David. Now his son, my friends, he's speaking of is Solomon. And then through this lineage comes Messiah. David now is firmly established as king, and he desires to build a temple for God. His own house is stable and secure, while the ark of God, symbolizing God's presence, remains in a tent. David wants to build a temple to honor God. God speaks to David, referring to him as my servant David. The divine promise here unfolds in the Davidic covenant. It speaks about number one, David's lineage. God will establish a Davidic king who will always rule. Number two, it speaks of one tribe. David's descendants will receive this eternal promise. And then number three, it speaks about the messianic hope. This text serves as the foundation for understanding that Yeshua is the Messiah, the son of David, whose kingdom will endure forever. My friends, David's desire to build a temple reflects his gratitude or perhaps an attempt to reciprocate God's blessings that he has given him. However, God's grace is not earned through works. It is freely given. The chapter here that we're reading in 2 Samuel, our Torah portion this week, or half Torah portion, underscores the nature of our relationship with God, where grace, not merit, prevails. It bridges historical events. It bridges the messianic hope and the profound truth that God's grace transcends human efforts. Like a beautifully restored train station, this passage invites us to linger and appreciate the intricate details of our relationship with the divine. Now let's tie in our Brit HaLashah portion for today in Acts 10, chapter 44. In Acts 10, uh, verse 44, we read, While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word, and those of the circumcision who believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also, for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then Peter answered, Can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? 
and he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then they asked him to stay a few days. Now, my friends, in our Brit Hadashah portion this week, in Acts 10, we witness a remarkable event. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon the Gentiles. Here are some key insights we've covered so far. Number one, we've covered the context and the transition. The scene begins with the introduction of Cornelius, a Gentile centurion. And Luke, the author here, he's masterfully resolves the storyline while simultaneously setting the stage for the ethnic and theological drama about to unfold in Jerusalem. The theological melody resonates throughout the book, the universal outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Now, number two, the second point, Peter has a conversion moment. Peter's ministry has been marked by witnessing the Spirit's work among the Gentiles. In Acts 10, here in verses 44 through 48, Peter becomes an active witness, bearing witness to the Word, and through him the Spirit manifests itself. And then point number three, the, the theme here in the Renaissance, or the, the it resonates, the Spirit's outpouring among the Gentiles echoes the events of Pentecost that we read in Acts chapter 2. In Peter's pronouncement that the Spirit would be poured out on all peoples finds fulfillments here. And then the fourth point, we have this character formation. Peter has this inner conflict. This is like a movie, my friends. Peter has this inner conflict torn between custom and conviction. And it adds depth to the scene here. The presence of his compatriots, or compatriots, the circumcised believers, heightens the tension. And the scene here captures the essence of God's limitless power and love breaking down barriers and inviting all into the family. Now, I want to continue in Acts chapter 11. In our Brit Hadashah portion continues in Acts 11, and we get to the climax of this historical event. So in Acts 11 verse 1 we read, Now the apostles and brethren who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. And when Peter came up to Jerusalem, those of the circumcision contended with him, saying, You went into uncircumcised men and ate with them? But Peter explained it to them in order from the beginning, saying in verse 5, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision, an object descending like a great sheet let down from heaven by four corners, and it came to me. When I observed it intently and considered, I saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And I heard a voice saying to me, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. And in verse 8, But I said, No, not so, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has at any time entered my mouth. But the voice answered me again from heaven, What God has cleansed you must not call common. Now this was done three times, and all were drawn up again into heaven. At that very moment, three men stood before the house where I was, having been sent to me from Caesarea. In verse 12, Then the Spirit told me to go with them, doubting nothing. Moreover, these six brethren accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. And he told us how he had seen an angel standing in his house, who said to him, Send men to Joppa and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, who will tell you words by which you and all your household will be saved. And in verse 15, As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them, as upon us at the beginning. Then I remembered the word of the Lord and how he said, John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. 
If therefore God gave them the same gift as he gave us when we believed on the Lord Yeshua, the Messiah, who was I that I could withstand God? And in verse 18, when they heard these things, they became silent and they glorified God, saying, Then God has also granted to the Gentiles repentance to life. Notice, my friends, nobody says, Oh, God has now given us swine and pork that we can eat now to our heart's desire. No, my friends, this is about men. It's not about food. The apostles and believers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles had received the word of God. Peter faced criticism from the circumcised believers for entering the house of uncircumcised men and eating with them. Peter recounts his vision in Joppa and how he spoke to Cornelius and his household. The Holy Spirit falls upon them just as it did upon Peter and the first and, and the Jewish believers, the, the Jewish apostles. And the 120 uh, gathered together on Shavuot Pentecost. Peter realizes that God grants the same gift of the Holy Spirit to the Gentiles who believed in Yeshua. He questioned why he should hinder God's work. And when the believers heard this, they had no further objections and they praised God. They recognized that even Gentiles could receive repentance leading to life. This passage, my friends, emphasizes God's inclusive plan for salvation Breaking down barriers between Jews and Gentiles, it reveals God's sovereignty and the role of the Holy Spirit in expanding the Messianic community to all nations. My friends, why do we try to hinder God's work by placing yokes around the necks of those just coming into the faith instead of lifting them up and welcoming them into the family? I, saw, I see this division among Messianic believers today, just as it was in Peter's day. Too many have prejudice and shun new believers not raised in a Jewish or Torah-observant household, and they regard them as second-class citizens. I rebuke this attitude in the name of Yeshua, and I warn those among us in leadership who treat non-Jewish believers as inferior that you will one day give an account to Yeshua, the King of Kings. My friends, let's treat one another with love and respect. If you're a new believer, learn from those who are seasoned and walking in Torah. Have a teachable attitude. If you're a Messianic Jewish teacher or leader, show respect, patience, and be willing to teach and get others involved. Be a mentor, not an overlord. My friends, I hope and pray that you've learned something this week. It's a little heavy this week, but I need to get this message across to you, and I pray that it is receptive to you and that the Holy Spirit is working in you and you're understanding what I've covered here this week. Comment us and let us know if you've learned anything this week. We love to hear from our listeners. So let's end it here for today. Take some time to meditate on these words and how they apply to your life. Pray for us in this message to go out and pray for those who are scattered throughout the world seeking their Messiah so that they will return to the Torah and their Hebraic roots. Share this message with your friends and family. Post the link on your social media pages and help us spread the gospel. You never know whose life you may affect. Remember to visit us at mymdi.org. Take one of our free classes. Download the daily Torah schedule. You can also order the daily Torah series of books to follow along. And if the Lord inspires you, please consider becoming a monthly sponsor so we can reach more people with these messages. Just click the giving menu option or donate button on the website. Tomorrow, we begin our next Torah series called Tazria, which means she conceives. Hit that subscribe button so you never miss a single episode. Until then, Shalom Aleichem, blessings and Shalom, my friends.